Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Beth and Richard. I'm really delighted to be here. I am going to talk today, um, hopefully kick off the day in a very stimulating way, talking about three themes, priorities, perspectives, and partnerships, and it all, of course, in relation to food. As Beth mentioned, um, Jane Pickering and I and a cast of others are in the midst of um, curating an exhibition that will open at the Peabody Museum of Natural History called Big Food, Health, Culture, and the Evolution of Eating. And I'm going to use this as an example because it's the thing I know best, um, being a connector to the museum community, but somewhat outside. But I want to also talk about some general ideas first that I hope will stimulate you and inspire you to be involved in these activities as well. When I was thinking about food and museums, I wanted to think about what was the foundation. And I found this quote from the Roman philosopher and statesman Cicero from 2,000 years ago. Cultivation to the mind is as necessary as food to the body. And I think, in a way, this is as good a, um, uh, a foundational element as, as maybe uh, I could have come up with otherwise. So keep cultivation and food really central to our, our thoughts today. We know, of course, that um, food is quite fundamental to life. And yet our eating habits and the evolution of, of how we eat, our diets, is very, very complex. And it's gone far beyond our simple nutritional needs. So what are some of the priorities? Well, I wanted to feature Museum Magazine as well and the beautiful Swiss shard there in the middle. Um, but just in the last month, we see Museum Magazine coming out, um, and you're in very good company with the New York Times Magazine, as well as Time, all with lead features on food. And as Beth mentioned, we have a wonderful burgeoning um, food community. There are farmers markets popping up everywhere, um, focusing especially on local and fresh foods, um, organic foods, and artisanal cheeses and breads and, and honeys and so forth. And I noticed yesterday you, again, um, being as progressive as you are here at the Phipps, had the farmer's market right here on the grounds. There's farm to school which uh, those of you here last night heard um, Chef Cass talk about. But there's also schools to farms. We have children all over growing food um, and often using that food in their own cafeterias. Uh, but there is a high school in New Haven where we are from called Common Ground where they are actually selling food, their own food. It is a, it is a school that is committed to um, agriculture and the environment. And they're actually using it to teach these high school students not only how to grow food, but how to market and sell. And then bringing some of those resources back into the school to continue to fuel their activities. There are political and, and environmental movements that are around food, like Food Democracy Now!, which is about supporting farms and sustainable agriculture. There's a slow food movement as well, a little bit political, a grassroots movement, again, focusing on reconnecting food. And I think, uh, Beth, this could come in this afternoon as we talk about food as connector. But of course, in addition to slow food, there is fast food. And there are corner stores, particularly in urban areas like where I live, on every corner. We did, uh, we worked with a dozen high school students last summer to map the environment in New Haven in six low-resource neighborhoods. We were looking for food and also physical activity <coughs> indicators. And we mapped 104 stores that were in these six neighborhoods. And uh, perhaps not surprising, um, in one way, on the other hand, the scope was quite surprising to me, 67% of the stores, of the food stores in these neighborhoods were fast, were uh, corner stores. 
And these corner stores, of course, sell mostly high fat, high sugar, uh, calorie dense, and cheap food. Now, you know, if the corner store closes at 9 p.m., not to worry, because 24 hours a day, you can get high fat, high sugar, calorie dense food, and you don't even have to leave the comfort of your car. This is what we've now come to call the food swamp. And Barry Popkin from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill documented that there are now five fast food restaurants for every one supermarket in the United States. Beth mentioned the food desert, probably a term more common and, and one that we're more familiar with. Here's a map of the United States, and uh, the, the USDA definition of a food desert is where there, people have no car and no supermarket store within a mile, and you can see that there's a big swath of food deserts, particularly in the mid-Atlantic and all through the south and southeast, but they are all over the country, and they are in urban areas as well as rural areas. Another food um, uh, transformation is really the great burgeoning of what we call factory foods, highly processed foods, none of which we'll see today at the FIPS, of course. And then there's the astonishment of portion size. It is really stunning when you begin to look at what we now call portion distortion. In the middle, we have the astonished baby and the um, ridiculous portion size. But on the right and left, we see, compared to 20 years ago, whether it's popcorn or cheeseburgers, really a doubling in what we know to be a healthy portion size. And not only is the portion size doubled, of course, the calories are doubled. And if you're going to have that cheeseburger, you might want some soda to wash it down with. And Mark Bittman has documented that the average American drinks 44.7 gallons of soda per year, sugar-sweetened beverages. By the way, the average American drinks only about 22 gallons of milk. So, perhaps present company excluded, uh, we drink more than twice as much soda as milk. I was quite surprised to see this next image, that is the one um, on your right. And that is, now I'm moving from annual consumption to daily consumption and children. Beginning with children as young as ages two to five, they are consuming an extra 200 calories per day. And older children and teens, up to 350 extra calories per day. These calories translate into pounds, translate into obesity. And so while it is not just any one type of food or beverage, there is no question, the data are now clear, that sugar-sweetened beverages are driving the obesity epidemic. And I do want to commend Phipps for taking, I think, a really courageous stand of removing sodas from, from your food service, and Sodexo as well. Um, I know that it's, you know, it's a scary thing, but it, it is the right thing to do, and it does fit with mission. And you see data like this, and you see why it's so important, because children, for many, um, for many museums, at least our Natural History Museum, the Children's Museums, are our, your core visitors, and we want to keep them healthy and strong. <clears throat> So, in summary, how has the food environment changed? Availability, increased eating out, calorie-dense food, portion size, amount of processing, and the amount of liquid calories. So, in many ways, this is really, in my mind, um, some of the issues of why food is a priority. Now, as museum curators and, and staff and so forth, the next question you need to ask is, what perspective do I take? And I wanted to begin um, 
with some work uh, that Beth shared with me from the American Association of Museums, and that is these seven cornerstones of excellence for U.S. museums. Um, I know you're all familiar with this, probably more than I, but the first is public trust and accountability, and second, mission and planning. And I think this issue of perspective, of saying, how do I bring food into what I'm doing in the museum, and clearly they need to tie with your public trust, with your mission, with your leadership. In working with Jane Pickering and others at the, uh, at the Peabody Museum, I learned a lot about collections and collection stewardship, and we have over 12 million objects at the Peabody, and one of the first questions that uh, we talked about as we began to develop our own exhibition was how can we best use and um, share the collections with the visitors? so that we really wanted our exhibition to be tied in to our core mission and our collections. Of course, education is important, um, and we'd be nothing without the financial stability and then issues related to facilities. So I'll come back to bits and pieces of this, um, but really it's for you to think about in deciding your own perspective in bringing this forward. There are several food exhibitions ongoing right now. Um, I don't know if anybody is here from the National Archives, but um, is anybody here? Um, What's Cooking Uncle Sam is happening right now um, through the uh, first part of 2012. And this is a historical look on the government's effect of the American diet. There's some wonderful um, posters, and some of you, uh, you know, may participate personally or, or professionally in Meatless Mondays. And I thought that was sort of a new thing in the sustainability movement. But of course, um, those of you, uh, many of you probably know, this really came out during the war. It was considered the patriotic thing to do. Um, to conserve um, meat. And so there are some wonderful images, and as you make your way down to D.C., um, it looks like quite a wonderful um, show. If you're heading the other direction, up to Boston, the Science Museum of Boston has an exhibition now through January 1st called What I Eat. Uh, and it's got these beautiful photographs, 25 of them, uh, from around the world, and what uh, it, various individuals eat in any given day. And the numbers that are down across the, um, that are vertical, adjacent to the description, are the number of calories per day. And so this is organized thinking about um, the number of calories, beginning with this Maasai herder who eats about 800 calories a day, uh, all the way through um, uh, many, many more, uh, and really quite excessive intake of calories. So there's some wonderful food things happening now. We are in the process of planning our exhibition in New Haven, which will open in February. You'll hear in a moment from the Children's Museum of Manhattan and the Newark Museum about work that will be opening in November. So this is certainly a burgeoning and exciting time for food and museums. And the question, of course, is what is your perspective? So Derek Briggs, our director, has stated that the Peabody's mission is to advance knowledge and a broad understanding of Earth's history, life, and cultures. This exhibit, that is our exhibit, Big Food, will explore and answer questions to arguably one of the most important transformations in health and human experience in the past century. And that is a focus not just on food, but on obesity. And when Jane comes up, she'll talk a little bit about, and the rest of the panel, on this focus on food and obesity and decisions about um, the nomenclature, what we call it and what our focal points are. Because we are a museum of natural history, it's not surprising that we will be taking, at least in part, a kind of evolutionary perspective, though not in the pure traditional way, um, because in fact, we need to think about contemporary images of evolution. Uh, this is from The Economist. This was a cover on the, of The Economist a few years ago. And uh, you can see, of course, um, the, the next phase of, uh, of man's evolution. Now, as Beth mentioned, I am a professor of the School of Public Health, and so, of course, my perspective is also one of health. And what's been wonderful in this transdisciplinary um, activity 
activity and, and this curatorial um, experience has been we've been able to take the public health perspective, link it with collections and museum priorities, and really broaden it out. And you'll see in a moment um, how we do that when I, I share with you the, the committee. But from a public health perspective, I, I would be remiss if I didn't spend just a moment on where are we in overweight and obesity in the nation. Colorado is the only state, as you can see in the light blue, that has uh, slightly less, I think it's 19.5% of adults are obese. 19.5%, one in five in Colorado, and that's the best that we do. When you, if you remember a few moments ago, the map of the food deserts, you see again this swath across the south where more than 30% of adults are obese. But there is not as, you know, but, but collectively, 25 to 30%. Now, if I add obesity in, 44 out of 50 states, we have 6 out of 10 adults who are overweight or obese. 6 out of 10 adults who are overweight or obese in 44 out of 50 states. On average, slightly more than half of adults. Let's look at children. Of course, they're younger. They haven't started, you know, they haven't started eating quite as much. But they, too, are on this upward trajectory. In the last 30 years, there's been a 30% increase in obesity among our children. Here we see uh, about 18% uh, of all children are obese, and more than a third are overweight or obese more than a third, so three or more out of ten. I want to just focus on kids for a minute, because I know for many people, children, again, are, are a core visitor, uh, core visitors for you in the museum. I've been at Yale for 22 years and been in the School of Public Health for most of that time. And as I was preparing for this talk, even I was surprised to learn that among obese children, 70% already have risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And the rate of stroke among children has increased 35% in the last decade. This indeed is a public health crisis. 70% have risk factors for cardiovascular disease. They have hypertension. They have hypercholesterolemia. And there are other consequences we'll talk about, I'll talk about in a moment as well. Now, it's not just the United States, of course. Our entire world is obesogenic. That is characterized by environments that promote increased consumption of unhealthy foods and sedentary lifestyles. And I think this is really important, because while we can talk about individual choice and behavior and decision making, we also need to be thinking about our food swamps and our food deserts and our food service and how, what, how our environments affect what we do. This is not just about the individual. We need to take an ecological perspective, a public health perspective, that recognizes that individuals live within families and within communities and within institutions. And we think about the kinds of, you know, food that are offered at, for school lunches or, again, in, in, um, in work sites or in, or in public venues. In the world, there are 300 million obese people and growing and overweight 1.5 billion. The United States is on a very rapid upward trajectory, but China and India particularly given the sheer number, the sheer population size, is really going to drive um, changes globally. Overnutrition and obesity now surpass undernourishment as the world's leading food and nutrition problem. 65% of countries uh, are, have overnutrition and obesity as leading causes of morbidity and mortality. So we've seen a decrease, again, from my perspective in public health, where infectious disease used to be a big driver. It's really now about um, chronic disease being the driver. 
What are the consequences? There are numerous health consequences, literally from head to toe. Increase in stroke, the psychological factors related to stigma and self-esteem. Obesity and overweight impact asthma, respiratory system, many different forms of cancer, diabetes, and orthopedic issues related to, to joint problems. Back to the U.S., 75% uh, of our nation's $2.5 trillion health care expenditures are actually being spent in chronic disease. So if we want to talk about health reform or food as medicine, we need to think about prevention. And we need to think about how to reduce um, this rate of expenditure, frankly, so that we could spend money on things that can be gr more greatly value added be they museums and cultural elements, but also healthy lifestyles, play, um, you know, really the rest of our lives and improving quality of life, not spending money on treating disease. That is preventable. And as serious and sort of crisis-driven as these statistics are, it is important also to say that these are preventable issues, and I think it's very important to think about um, young people in particular. So that's some of the perspective that I bring to this, and I want to have you think about what perspectives do you bring as an art gallery, as a garden, as a children's museum. So uh, finally, I'll close with my third theme, and that is about building partnerships in these endeavors. In museums, you have your key stakeholders and known partners, and you all know who those are. But as we move into thinking about food, and if I can say food and health, there's an opportunity for new partnerships as well. And um, uh, I, I've been threatening my dean that uh, I'm going to quit my day job and, and join Jane at the Peabody if they'll have me, because I'm having just a wonderful time in this new partnership. And it's really been the Peabody Museum. CARE is the, the community health initiative that I run, which is called Community Alliance for Research and Engagement. And a third key partner, the Yale Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. So we've been able to create these wonderful new partnerships to bring um, an idea to life in the museum. Museum. Funders, again, we've got traditional funders, but also new content-driven funders. And for us, um, the Donahue Foundation, which is a local found, a statewide foundation in Hartford, Connecticut, their mission is to, pro to promote health research of practical benefit. And Lynn Garner, the president of the Donahue Foundation, wrote a check for $20,000 to the Peabody Museum, a new donor for Peabody. And they were thrilled, be, uh, and she was a really early adopter because she knew how important it was to have kind of money on the table so that we could then go to other donors. And it re she really felt that it met their mission of practical benefit that was reaching a large group of children and adults and in our region that otherwise they may not reach. Um, WellPoint Foundation also, WellPoint Foundation is out of the Blue Cross Blue Shield family, and they came forward with a large donation, and maybe Jane will talk a little bit more about, about this, because if, if, it is really the practical operational issues that I'm sure many of you care about. I'll just mention also General Electric and their Healthy Imagination Initiative. They're providing some in-kind resources with regard to some interactive kiosks. And then along the bottom, we have what may be for us a more traditional locus of funding, and that is Yale itself being a university-based museum. I mentioned uh, briefly the curatorial team. Um, here we are in alphabetical order. I want to mention uh, Rick Bribieskus, who is the chairman of anthropology. I've been at Yale for 22 years. I had never met anybody closely from the uh, anthropology department because public health is across town. And so it's been great also to work with Rick and bring that perspective in. Um, Jackie Brulé is a graduate student of mine. Laura Friedman, David Heiser, uh, Sally Pilato, uh, are, and Jane, of course, are all from the museum, and um, Meg Orsieri and Marlene Schwartz are from the Rudd Center. So it's been wonderful to work with this team. When we began to get together, we, some, I know this is a little hard to read, but 
I wanted it a little hard to read because these were just the kinds of questions that were floating around in these initial conversations. With genetics contributing to about one third of weight variance, what about the other two thirds? How did we get to this point? What biological, societal, and cultural changes have contributed to the epidemic? And perhaps most importantly, how can we change behavior and an environment to improve health? How can we work in the food community to uh, really mobilize and think about positive change. And so we translated this, whoops, sorry, we translated this into some aims. We wanted to identify contributors to our food environment, understand complex forces of change, articulate the scientific, social, and cultural determinants of obesity and health, and promote collaboration and advocacy regarding food, health, and sustainability. So this is what has driven now our work as we go from idea to action. Just to give you a sneak peek, this is some of the beautiful work of um, Sally Pilato and Laura Friedman, our design team, and these are some of the colors and images that will be part of the build as we move forward. Some of the content that we're approaching uh, are listed here, and you can see it reflects our broad multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary perspective big food, what is food, the evolution of food biology, industrialization, urbanization, and globalization, um, uh, the history of modern food, food marketing, portion distortion, issues of health. By the way, you can see obesity only appearing now after folks have already been through maybe two-thirds of the exhibition, do we get to this? And another topic I think we'll, we'll talk about in the discussion. And finally, an idea, because it was very important to me, again, from a public health perspective, to be thinking about not just the problems, but the solutions. So who are some health heroes locally, nationally, and so forth? So just a few images, and these are all subject to change. Um, unlike um, Tori and Ismail, who you'll hear about, who are gearing up to open just next month, we've got a couple of months ahead. But our title is called Big Food. And when you come into the exhibition at the Yale Peabody, and we hope that you will come, you will walk through, you'll begin by walking, having an experiential thing, walking through a corridor of food. And the corridor of food will be to scale based on how the average American diet in a year. So that 44.7, if, if you'll permit us the uh, rounding up, you will likely see 45 gallons of soda, um, you know, in there as we walk through, and 22 gallons of milk, and 150 pounds of meat, and so forth. So we're, we're kind of excited about, about that build. We are going to talk about not just historical hunter-gatherers, but contemporary hunter-gatherers, because we are a natural history museum, and this is some of the work that Rick is doing. In terms of, you know, the way we used to get food and the way we get food now, issues of um, industrialization of our food. We also are going to teach kids and, and adults, frankly, on how to read a food label. Don't just rely on the big print on the front, but read the back. Re and understand what some key elements are around, uh, you know, five key elements. Be a nutrition detective and learn how to read a food label. And so we'll send people away with that. We're going to talk about social marketing and product placement. It's ubiquitous. We don't even notice it anymore because it is indeed everywhere. But there's some good social marketing as well. The New York City Department of Health has been really progressive. Some of you may have seen these ads like this uh, in the subways and you know, around um, on the billboards. And so these are um, sort of some, po I don't know if I quite call this a positive image, but at least a positive campaign on saying, you know, stop drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. And um, we are going to be launching a water campaign as part of this that will be in the museum, but also on bus placards around the city and in the schools as we work through our um, our educational initiatives. Now I know some of you, how many of you are here from art museums? A few, yeah. Um, so there'll be something 
at the Peabody Museum of Natural History for you as well. This is Brian Wansink, who is a professor of nutrition and food science at Cornell University. Um, his brother, Craig Wansink, happens to be a New Testament scholar at Virginia Wesleyan University. And the Wansink brothers published an article last year in the International Journal of Obesity that evaluated 52 paintings of the Last Supper from 1000 to 2000 AD. They used computer-assisted technology, CAD, um, to, uh, to, to look at the head-to-bread ratio, because in every image of the Last Supper, uh, be it uh, old or new, there, Jesus is always present, as is some food. And so you can see these blue outlines. They looked at the size of the head. They evaluated it in relation to the bread. And they concluded that main courses increased 69% over 1,000 years in our presentation uh, or in artistic renderings of the Last Supper. The plates increased by 66%, and the bread increased by 23%. So insofar as art imitates life, we in fact see that reflected here. I mentioned General Electric. We will have um, a couple of interactive kiosks with their Health Imagination initiative, looking at the relationship of food and health. We will also have um, the fantastic Michael Anderson, um, a um, uh, staff member and ar f amazing artist at the Peabody, um, building um, big organs, uh, not just big bugs, but uh, healthy livers and fatty livers and healthy hearts and fatty hearts and respiratory systems that are constrained so that we really can look at the health impact, uh, uh, as I said, later in this exhibition. We want to, if we think about energy balance, it's not just about food, but it's about physical activity and sedentary behavior. And I know, again, um, particularly Tori will talk about, and I think uh, Ismail as well, about issues of exercise and being active. And we, too, will address these issues of sedentary behavior of the average um, kid. We want to send another one of our strong messages that we want to bring from museum out into the neighborhoods is uh, based on the data, the public health data, that televisions in children's bedrooms are one of the most harmful things, not just for health, but also for academic achievement. And so wh that's another key message we want to get across. We'll have bikes um, showing calorie expenditure and so forth. So we'll be talking about food, but also the other end of the energy balance. We're going to talk about the economics of food. We are going to talk about health heroes. Um, president Levin, that is the president of Yale, did invite Michelle Obama. We don't know yet if she'll come, but we'll talk about uh, many health heroes. And we're going to close um, with, again, this is, this is the issue of perspective and priority and partnership. We want um, people to, to walk out making a commitment. Um, some of you may have known of the field of behavioral economics, um, popular books like Nudge and um, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Caldwell. And we are actually going to uh, give people, I, I call them sort of wooden nickels, and what we want to do is have people really commit to what they're going to do for themselves, their families, and their community. So that when they walk out, it's not just all gloom and doom, but what can they do to make a difference? Um, Blue State Coffee is um, a local small business, and they at, if you go in and buy a cup of coffee, you get a wooden nickel, and you get to commit to which um, philanthropic cause you'd like to donate to. And so we're going to work with them and, and, um, and then actually use this as data. And maybe this is something, we didn't talk about this last night, but maybe this issue of evaluation is something we could also talk about in the um, discussion. Because, I, again, for me as an as a academic, I think it's really important to think about how do we measure our impact. And I think this is one way we want to see what are people committing to, um, even if the data is a little messy. So that's some of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, it's about having big ideas, and in our case, big food. And really now, the question is for you and the, um, you know, as we move on into the day, what is your priority 
what is your perspective, and how can you best cultivate partnerships to bring food and museums together and to educate, entertain, and cultivate um, the museums and health. So thank you very much, and uh, it's lovely to be here.